Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Thursday, May 31st, 2012, and we have two special guests tonight, Khalid Smith and Nicole Tucker Smith. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. I, you're going to have to merge turn your mic off. Thank you for that. Uh, I put these two pictures in such a way that it looks, Nicole, like you're kind of smiling lovingly at Khalid. You are married. This is correct, right? This, this is true, yes. Although in the picture I was looking out the window, but this is true. We are married. I, I do like to think she was thinking of me. Thanks. Thanks, both of you, for being here. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. That's web20labs.com, all about helping create conversation around education. Thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for providing this service and space. It is the fifth anniversary of Classroom 2.0. We're doing a lot of fun things. Um, we, we, those of you who are still patiently waiting for the 130 book chapters to come out, they are close to coming out. This is the crowdsourced book project we've got going. Lots of other fun things at classroom20.com. If you're going to be at ISTE, don't miss the shadow conference, ISTE Unplugged, all about the crowd. These are a number of crowdsourced events that we do that start Saturday with the all-day unconference that we used to call EduBloggerCon and now call Social EdCon. Uh, it's very fun to also announce that on Saturday night we're going to be having this terrific after party that Study Blue and Startup Weekend EDU are helping to sponsor uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Marriott next to the Convention Center. We'll probably talk about that in the interview tonight, but don't miss that either. That's going to be a blast. Um, lots of fun. It's the unplugged.com. If you've missed the Social Running Summit, that was a free and recorded event. Uh, over 70 recordings on the use of Web 2.0 in social media and education. Go to sociallearningsummit.com or to Classroom 2.0 and click on the link for Social Learning Summit. Coming up, the Library 2.012 conference in October, the 2012 Global Education Conference, both worldwide conferences, hundreds of sessions, all free, thanks to IRN and San Jose State University. And we have some really fun conferences we're about to announce, including one that looks now like it's going to lift off. It will be called Learning 2.0, Teaching and Learning in the Age of the Internet, as part of the Department of Ed's uh, upcoming Connected Educators Month in August. So look for announcements about that. Coming up next week, we're going to hear from Ruth at opensource.com, Christine DiPaolo on student branding. The week after that, Jonathan Finkelstein joins us to talk about virtual communities. Uh, Michael Karnjan Naprak, I'm sure I've not done that justice, the CEO of Skillshare is going to come on. David Preston on July 3rd, Marcia Connor on social learning and their book on social learning. Elliot Washer comes on to talk about big picture learning again on the 17th. Anyway, lots of fun and lots of fun waiting in the wings. If you've missed any of our sessions, they are all recorded in full Blackboard Collaborate format and MP3s. Over 250 shows up there, something surely that will catch your attention. Brian Alexander was sort of brilliant on Tuesday night talking about uh, Web 2.0 technology and liberal arts colleges. Elizabeth Merritt talked to us about the future of education in museums and what museums can teach us about learning. Mark Bauerlein on the internet Back again, lots of fun. Keith Devlin, the math guy at NPR and Stanford professor. Anyway, hopefully there's something there you're going to be interested in. So those of you who are with us now live, we're going to give you the chance to indicate where you're participating from. Look for the icons to the left of the map. You're looking for the second one down, the star. You click on it twice, and then click on the map. And you can let us know the time, the temperature, all that kind of good stuff. A oh, nice international crowd. India, Australia, Singapore. I can't remember. No, that's too high for Singapore. Japan. Paul, thanks for being with us. If 
feel free to keep putting those notes in the chat. Thanks for tuning in wherever you're listening from. We sure appreciate it. So Khalid, uh, can we show the video? Are we going to be able to do that tonight? Um, hmm, wow, I wasn't expecting that, but um, I, I don't, I don't think so. Um, we we haven't really released it for for general uh, consumption yet, um, and um, I think for a we'll leave it as a teaser. Leave it as a teaser. Yeah, the rule that we've been playing kind of is that you know for a live audience, like it's been fine. So as I've controlled it, I don't know how this records or or where it would where it would land necessarily, um, but. Um, I'd love to be able to share stuff with uh, with folks about what, what we're doing with the film, et cetera, and how people kind of take a um, take a gander at it. But actually, I think now that I'm thinking more about it, uh, the I'd love to be able to debut it at ISTE, and so I, I want folks to to come to our uh, event uh, at the at ISTE Unplugged, uh, where we can kind of debut it for a, for a larger audience. That's the perfect answer. Yeah. Do go ahead and Do turn that mic off. Hey, so uh, it's fun to have the two of you on the show, and you both have really interesting backgrounds that relate to uh, education and entrepreneurship. Can I get you to tell kind of an abbreviated story, each of you, of of how you got to where you are? Certainly. Uh, you have a preference on who you'd like to hear first. Yeah, let's yeah, start, with, start Nicole. with Nicole. Ah, that's what I like to start, too. All right. So um, I, um, I actually I decided to, I went the old school route in terms of uh, becoming an educator. So, um, you know, I graduated from the University of Virginia Curry School, did my student teaching, um, taught for several years, and, um, and then uh, I was in a position at a school in Baltimore where I really felt like I wanted to learn more about leadership. And while I was in an admin program at Hopkins, I started working for Johns Hopkins Center for Technology and Education. And that's where I learned a lot about um, building web to red tools to help teachers in schools really maximize um, their abilities to impact student learning. And then from there, um, I started working from Baltimore County Schools. I've been in central office. Now I'm an assistant principal at a school, and so now I'm I'm putting everything into place, sort of where the the rubber meets the road in terms of um, really working with students every day. And it's all of those lessons that I've learned that have also led me to uh, found LessonCast, uh, and uh, we'll I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Um, but it's really the experiences in terms of being a central office administrator, a school-based administrator, developing um, web tools, and really just having a passion for helping students, you know, reach their full potential and and learn as much as they can and and, and apply skills in a way that'll really transform their opportunities. Cool. Yeah. So the uh, the contrast with me is that um, I really came at this through the. Uh, Experiential education uh, route. So, uh, so formally, um, I have degrees in um, chemical and biomedical engineering. So, I started off very, very technical, uh, and then uh, went and worked for uh, Procter and Gamble for um, ten years, actually. So, I, I was an engineer with them for three years, and then I moved over into marketing and brand management. So, fun fact is, I could tell you, uh, I could I could wax eloquent on the uh, on the intricacies of makeup for uh, quite a while, uh, as I as I uh, was the brand manager, assistant brand manager on CoverGirl, and then the brand manager of Max Factor Cosmetics uh, for for a long time, um, and then uh, really so from from that experience gained uh, kind of the, the engineering and then the marketing business side. Um, and left there in 2008, uh, thinking that um, I was going to go and, and join the startup world. I thought that I, I'd learned how to run a big company, and I thought that you know a small company would be nothing because it's just it would be way simpler. And, uh, and I, I went and kind of put up my own shingle and started consulting and uh, and went through a a 
a process much like many of the folks who go to Startup Weekend now. So I, I kind of did it the wrong way, and so I, as, as a result of that, learned a lot of lessons that that uh, that qualify me to help people and, and guide them through the process as they go. Um, so I went and worked for the Obama campaign for a while, and was a deputy field officer down in in Virginia. And then I that that led me to meet a lot of people in the nonprofit world that were looking for strategy work. And I, uh, I I started consulting with some DC area nonprofits, which was really jazzing for me because I loved the idea of working with people and on missions that I really believed in. Uh, and I, one of my big clients was AmeriCorps, uh, which is the AmeriCorps alums, which is the alumni association of, uh, among other things, Teach for America. They have lots of other uh, AmeriCorps programs that involve educators. And so kind of got into talking about communities of people who are engaged in education and how to activate them and what the strategy was and ended up helping them with their uh, strategy work uh, for a long time and came back home and was talking to my wife about that and was like, wow, we're really kind of jazzed about that. And um, that's what led us, when she had the idea for lesson test, uh, that's what led us to say, well, I think I've got an idea of like what strategically could work if we've got an idea of like what a, what a great innovation would look like in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, a way to promote and, and, and increase student achievement through some technology startups, then I think we can get together and do this. And so, you know, we, we started that and, and through that process of being in Baltimore, trying to find a community, uh, starting up a startup in, in education technology is how I, I stumbled upon this other startup called Startup Weekend. Uh, and began attending their meetups and, you know, went to one, flew out to San Francisco, kind of on a, taking a risk, not knowing what it was going to be, and, and uh, had an awesome time and met a lot of people and, and ended up going to uh, the following four or five or six education events up until at, at one point when the organization was finally looking to uh, find someone to be able to uh, help scale that and run the organization, you know, they, they went and they, they uh, looked to me and said, you've been to all of these events, like what would you do to, to make them better, to improve them? And I still happen to have a couple of ideas, because I'm extremely opinionated. And, uh, and they loved it and they, you know, gave me um, lots of rain and a great organization and, uh, and that's how I came to kind of be both doing a uh, lesson cast as well as um, being the uh, education leader of Startup Weekend Education. Thanks for remembering to turn your mic off. It's also kind of a signal to me that you have finished them. It helps me. So, so um, there's some delicacy here because you uh, um, represent Startup Weekend EDU. You also represent uh, lesson cast and there is a commercial aspect to lesson cast. Um, and so we're not really doing a commercial for lesson cast, but I'm really interested, Nicole, in what kinds of lessons starting an EDU startup project has brought to you. What do you think you've learned? Um, one thing I've learned is to have confidence in the expertise that I've developed as an educator. So um, Khalid went to the first um, startup weekend EDU. And then with the next one, he, you know, asked me to come, and I was very nervous. I said, you know, what can I share? I do. I'm not a business person. Um, I know instruction, and I know school leadership. And um, am I really going to be taken seriously? And so, um, what I've learned is that, uh, you know, I have a lot to offer, and other kids, educators have a lot to offer, and their strength in the dialogue in talking with um, all individuals who are in the startup world, and, and more specifically the um, education startups, um, and I think we're all stronger for it. Um, and so one of the lessons that I've, I've learned is that, you know, to have confidence to, to, to go ahead and and go for it, and um, also to know that it's it's not easy necessarily um, to balance these things. And, and an assistant principal, which takes a lot of 
um, energy, and then I, we, we consider our startup Lesson Cats our third child, because we do have two little ones, and, um, and so it's not easy, but I am motivated by having an impact in education, and if we can help any teacher who can then in turn help any student, then um, for me it, it's worth it. But it, it all started with getting over the hump of just saying, you know, am I even worth someone listening to me, and, and now I, I can say that I am. So you could be worth listening to. The product can be really good, but one of the dilemmas of the educational market is the scale at which products are sold. So how does a small entrepreneurial startup with a devoted educator think about, and this is again for Nicole, how do you think about marketing a product in a ecosystem that really seems to favor the large company? Yeah, I, um, really we had to think about, um, you know, we, we need to live. Um, we do need to earn some money to, in, in, in order to be able to help anyone, we need to be able to function and be self-sustaining. But we also had to think really carefully about, well, who should pay? Um, and when we first pitched the idea, um, so many people wanted us to sell directly to teachers or to sell directly to parents and, and students because it's a larger market. And we really had to explain that it's part of our core values that, that we weren't not trying to sell to teachers. That was not what we wanted to do. Um, we also, um, part of our core values is not having these top-down mandates necessarily that don't fit with individual schools and, and don't work um, necessarily with what um, a school community or any kind of learning community is trying to do to help their community move forward. And so we really as, uh, had to look for a sweet spot in terms of reaching out to schools. And, and as a school administrator, you know, I know my budget. I know what we can afford. I know what we spend on other things. Um, and when I compare the value with what we can provide schools, I don't feel guilty at all um, about selling at the school level where a principal can say, this is something that will move my school forward. This is a worthy investment. Um, and in fact, that it's, it's not only um, an investment in terms of the tool, but it really helps. With, it's an investment for the, the, the educators as well, everyone involved in the, in the school. And so that was really where we found our sweet spot in terms of staying true to our core values, not selling to teachers, not selling to parents and students, but selling to school decision makers who um, can then say this is something that will be good for our community. And, yeah, we're turning the mic off. So final question for Nicole, not final one of the evening, but on this topic. Um, given that in the, in the world of entrepreneurship, most attempts don't succeed, and of those that do succeed, some of them succeed at sort of subsistence level or very low revenue. What kind of advice would you give an educator who is thinking about a product or an idea? And how do you frame that within the expectations of success? Well, my, I have two pieces of advice. My, my first advice is to be willing to pivot. And, and by that I mean, I ha this is an evolving idea, and by that I mean, um, I may have been thinking somewhere else and I was willing to listen to feedback and really get at the core of the problem that we're trying to solve and your first attempt may not be the best attempt um, and being willing to um, make changes, really listen to potential customers or just listen to people who um, have advice to share and we can learn from them. Um, and so that willing, that's a you know, lean startup term being pivot. But really the being willing to pivot and listen and change direction and stay to your core, but then make changes that are necessary to one, be sustaining and two, have the greatest impact. And along the lines of having the greatest impact, you know, education startups are not necessarily going to be the fastest in making money. And um, as an educator, um, I knew going, I knew that going into education. You know, obviously, I did not go in um, trying to be rich. I, I, I do want to. Uh, I don't want to undersell my value, but um, we, the main purpose is to make a difference. And so, um, you have to have certain 
Oh, for reality check about, uh, you know, we're not going to, like, laugh on the charts like Facebook or something like that, but um, that's also not why we got into it in the first place. Um, we want to be able to sustain and we want to be able to grow, but it's not it's not a get-quick-rich scheme. I'll put it that way. Some people go into education thinking, oh, everyone needs education, so let's get rich, and, and that's not it. It, it requires patience and um, being willing to pivot and being willing to listen and um, just just being determined. Thanks, Nicole. So I'm, I tried to frame this or set this up, Khalid, in such a way as you might be able to address some of those same issues and concerns from the framework of Startup Weekend EDU. Because I think that you have a deeper goal here of helping to address some of these issues within the framework of what, you know, the work that you're doing there. Yeah, certainly. So let's start with uh, this question of the scale and the, the ecosystem within which products are sold. Um, in fact, let's even back up a little bit more than that and just give us a brief description of what takes place at a startup weekend. Oh, certainly. Um, yeah, so, so for anyone who's not familiar, um, while, while we are talking about Startup Weekend education, um, and, and that's my main focus, like that, it's a very small portion of what overall Startup Weekend is. So uh, the, the, in the larger context, yeah, so Startup Weekend is a, a 501c3 nonprofit. And, uh, and it's a global entity. It, we've done uh, events in uh, over 200 countries, um, six continents. Um, we're doubling year on year. We've done over 500 events, have over 30,000, uh, maybe, oh, wait, nope, I'm lying to you, 40,000 um, alumni who have come through uh, a various uh, Startup Weekend program. Uh, and we think of it as a, a starting entry point for people who are interested in entrepreneurship and who go through and use it as an opportunity to learn by doing how to refine their idea and, 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 assert, and certainly particularly how to build their team and meet other uh, team members and build the community that's going to assist them uh, in refining their idea, helping them find all the resources that they need. Um, so from a format standpoint, it's a, it's a 54-hour um, competition format uh, where people get together, designers, developers, uh, entrepreneurs, hackers, if you will, and they uh, pitch an idea. So the first thing that happens is everyone gets an opportunity to stand up and say, um, this is my, this is the problem that I'm trying to solve. This is the solution that I'm proposing, and this is what I need in order to uh, build that solution. And um, everyone has an opportunity to, to, to pitch their idea, and then there's a voting process where the crowd votes and decides on the top about 10% of those ideas, and then those people become team leaders. And they do a quick speed dating process where they say, oh, these are the people who I need, so I need a developer, I need a designer, I need a a business planning expert in this field that I'm working on, whatever it happens to be, and they build this team, and then they spend the, the following, uh, the rest of Friday night, then all day Saturday, and all day Sunday, uh, refining that idea, building uh, a minimally viable product, which is an example, uh, an example of your concept that you can share with a customer and get their reaction to, have them understand whether or not they'd like to purchase it, to have them uh, play with it, and have them be able to tell you the value proposition that they think that it has so that you can alter what it is that you're doing and continually learn and innovate. Mm -hmm. And in, that, in this process, as they go, we sort of bombard them with resources. So we are walking around our um, developers, they are successful entrepreneurs, they are venture capitalists and angel investors, they are industry experts who are all very casually just coming down and sitting at their table where they're working and just asking them some fundamental questions and saying, well, what are you building and what are your challenges and how do you know somebody wants that and 
Uh, what are what is it that um, is the most important thing within all of this stuff that you're trying to do to your customer, and what what should you be focused on first? And uh, everyone who's tried to do that has really failed in distribution. So let's tackle that issue first. How are you going to get distribution? And asking all those kind of fundamental questions so that at the end of 54 hours you feel like your idea has been battle tested, that it has that you built a network of people who you can follow up with and that you've built a team and you understand that that team has gone through the stresses and trials and tribulations of the weekend, that, that you have a better idea of whether or not you can work with these specific individuals, but also what type of individuals you need in order for your idea to be successful as we understand that, that uh, most startups fail not because of the strength of the idea, but because of the cohesiveness and the abilities and skills of the team themselves and their ability to pivot, like my wife said, until they get to something that is a viable and sustainable business model. So we're going to do kind of a mini version of that. Uh, in the after party on Saturday after social ed con, right? So the sort of pitch fire part. Yeah, so I'm really excited about that. So um, one of the, the things that uh, has been a challenge for Startup Week in Education has been kind of getting the word out and the experience. Like Nikki said, you, I, I can't tell you how many times I get an email from a teacher who says, hey, I'm just a teacher, can I come? And, uh, and and we, the challenge that we have is really getting people to uh, see and experience what a startup weekend actually is and, and feel the energy of it. And, uh, and, and this is a great opportunity for us to take a small element of it. So just that Friday night portion where you've got an idea, you're nervous, you're not sure, you get up there, you take one minute on the microphone, you say, here's who I am, here's the problem that I'm trying to solve. Here's, here's what I think my solution could be, and here's what I would need to be able to build it. And then go through uh, a, a bit of a, 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 some validation of asking some questions or getting people in the crowd to start asking, well, how would that work and what does it mean? And having the crowd pick some ideas um, is a tremendously validating uh, experience just in the beginning. I can't tell you how many people come and don't ever plan to pitch and are just sitting there to listen and get kind of wrapped up in the frenzy of people just sharing their ideas and then ultimately end up leading a team and having a transformative experience. So my hope is to bring some of that to um, the ISTE Unplugged community on Friday night and have them feel just a little taste of it and then offer some uh, scholarships to a, a startup weekend education in an area where some of those folks are coming from. I'm really looking forward to it. Jeff has a long question in the chat. And Jeff, I'm going to encourage you to email Khalid directly on that um, rather than spend time or attention on it at this point. Um, and so Khalid, if you're comfortable, you can put your email address in there. Or or Jeff, you can put yours in and, and uh, take that um, offline. So Khalid, I'm interested in this sort of qu these questions of the current ecosystem for selling into schools, the scale issues. Um, the expectations for success. I know you're personally really committed to uh, helping to solve some of these through Startup Week in EDU. Can you tell me how you think that, um, uh, that what you're doing will have an impact? Sure. Um, so, oh my. Um, so uh, there's, there's, there's a couple of things that I think Startup Weekend Education addresses. Uh, so I think on the on the first most basic level, what it does is it says that that we believe that stronger communities and stronger teams make better solutions. Uh, so attacking the problem of uh, education technology not always being solutions to education problems. There's a lot of cool tech out there um, that is popular but not necessarily uh, effective in increasing student achievement, for example. And, and we believe that that's a direct corollary to, just, to not having a, a, a full spectrum of, uh, of, of the right people on these, on these startup teams that are developing these solutions. And that if they had uh, educators on these teams, uh, they'd be able to ask those questions and iterate and have that infused kind of into the DNA of the organization. 
Um, so so it's, it's, it's building off the idea that the, the members of the team add more than just their individual expertise. They, they actually add this, uh, this element of the, the mission and the, and the DNA, if you will, of the organization that helps them to uh, make sure that their products reflect that. And so we think that forming better teams is going to eventually cause us to have um, better uh, education technology and also will allow more people, more ideas to be able to enter into that market. So the barriers to entrepreneurship and education entrepreneurship are, are various and many. And, uh, and what we think we have is a, a model and a process to reduce the uh, the barriers to entry in a lot of ways, to help people get over their own fears and trepidations about sharing their idea, to help them connect with other people that can help them along the way, and ultimately to strengthen this ecosystem and, and help people through all of the individual steps that it takes for, for scalable solutions. As you know, the education conundrum is not going to be solved by any one particular massive startup. It's going to be, you know, thousands of ideas that all collectively iterate around this idea of, of improving student achievement and leveraging technology to help improve educators and education. Uh, so that's, that's a big one. And then, you know, as I think you were alluding to on a second one, like, you know, so Startup Weekend can become a advocate for entrepreneurship in general. And, and with that, we can take on uh, some significant challenges that exist within uh, markets and and can help uh, address these as advocates for entrepreneurship at a, at a level that a, the individual entrepreneur has a very tough time doing and and that it may not always be in the interest of the of the larger uh, corporation or entity once it has gotten to a size or scale where it, where those those issues are no longer big barriers to it um, so you know whether you take, you know, what you referred to with Nikki as, as the, the, the challenge in, you know, finding the sweet spot from a, a sales model of how do you, how do you find a, a viable market for uh, entrepreneur or for, for startup ideas in education, um, to the distribution model, to sales cycle. Like we think that, you know, lowering barriers of entry looks like addressing all of the pinch points that, that prevent innovation from growing and scaling regardless of where it comes from. And so what we want to promote is the idea that, you know, innovation can come from lots of different sources, whether that be entrepreneurship, whether that be small teams, whether that be large teams. But any pinch points which prevent great ideas from scaling and getting as and growing as large as they can. Um, are, are impediments to us producing a better society, and, and we think we can address some of those uh, through our efforts in, in education specifically. So, so I, am, I do want to talk to you more about entrepreneurship in general, um, because I think there's an interesting story there. But before we kind of shift gears on that, the message of trying to help build uh, channels or avenues for smaller organizations to sell into the school markets uh, is, a, is a great concept. Many people felt like the involvement of Pearson and Startup Week in EDU um, was sort of a slap in the face to that. Uh, how, how has that gone and how do you respond to people who question uh, whether the Pearson or other large companies are just going to absorb these ideas and sell them instead of supporting the entrepreneurs? Yeah, so um, I think the Pearson conundrum um, was, was definitely one of the most challenging kind of uh, moments in my professional career period. Um, you know, I, I really got to a point where I was, I was questioning like, okay, well, what, what do I believe and what are the principles that we're operating on, and what is the right thing uh, for us to do within this uh, within within this set of choices that we have? Um, and really, uh, where, where it came down to was, um, I, I understand the um, the visceral reaction that that many who have been uh, 
the many who are engaged in uh, innovation or, or education reform or whatever you want to call it have uh, towards towards Pearson. Uh, so a, a lot of people look at entrepreneurship and, and think that um, this is a they, they project onto it a lot of their goals and say, well, this is a way for us to uh, overturn the apple cart, or or this is a way for um, us to right some of the wrongs that are going on in terms of and, and, and what I just stated is, is that like we want to support innovation uh, and innovation coming from a, a variety of, of sources. Um, what Pearson really represents is um, a, a distribution network. Like what Pearson does really, really, really well, and, and I'm not knocking them for not being innovative or anything like that, um, because large large corporations, just as they grow, they, they have more challenges being uh, truly uh, disruptively innovative as you know, they, they kind of have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo and, and, and using this, this engine that they have tooled, tuned, this business model, uh, to its fullest extent and extracting as much value as they can out of that. Uh, but um, what Pearson does really, really well is that it, it scales innovation. So they, they figured out a solution where they can find innovation wherever it happens to come from, and they can uh, take it and they can they can they can scale it to uh, work through this convoluted system of uh, districts and state processes in which uh, solutions are sold um, through through sheer just just force. Um, and one of the big challenges that we had is I was looking at like, okay, like Startup Weekend as an entity has a responsibility as a as a global organization, you know, representing innovation and education to say, we need to find ways to address the largest pain points within the innovation marketplace. We need to find and address the, the bottlenecks that are preventing innovation from, from scaling. And and one of those undeniable biggest biggest uh, biggest areas is that it's difficult to distribute a good idea. It's difficult for once you once you have a solution that works and that and that drives student achievement. At some point, a startup or or any education company has to make a choice as to whether or not it's going to 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 turn into a sales organization and build the type of force that it would take to be able to drive its product through each of these sales channels, or it, 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 it is first with a choice of um, a potentially selling or, or finding a different uh, distribution strategy. And um, what the challenge that we're still working on, the, the, the challenge that we faced or that we posed to, to Pearson and, and what we're actively engaged in talks in, um, is really about what what can we do? How can how can Pearson become a um, a a? How can we help Pearson become a better uh, citizen or member of the community? And and why is it in Pearson's best interest? Like uh, similar to you know an IBM that that is is lauded for its support for for open standards and Linux. You know why? How can we? influence and show them and, and, and lead the way to them thinking about the way that they can support innovation in total and 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 know that they will get some benefit from it and, and see it as something that's that's in their best interest, but that also creates avenues where innovation can flow more freely, period. Um, and, and like I said, it's it's a it's a challenge, but I don't know of another organization that has the positioning that Startup Weekend has uh, to be able to bring them to the table and to have those kind of conversations uh, in a productive manner. Like you know, they 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 we can we can rail against them and we can uh, write emails and stuff and and they take a very kind of aloof uh, uh, response or, or position to to all of that and say yeah we understand that you know there are a few misguided folks who believe that you know we are acting in our own self interest and and yada yada and so you know somewhere between the two positions the truth lies but in the end of the day there's there's few folks who are offering them a process and 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 
and inviting them into a productive conversation that says, here's a way for you to think about this differently. Here's a way for you to think about your brand differently. Here's a way for you to achieve your mission of supporting education in a way that is less insulary, in a way that is more open, in a way that increases innovation, and in a way that's consistent with where every, everywhere, every industry in the 21st century is going. So someone is going to figure this out, and, and, and my conversations with uh, the, the people who have come to start a weekend, the people who I've met who are in Pearson in terms of and, and own either acquisitions or I've met the country managers of India, I've met their strategic acquisitions folks, um, each of them agree with me and say, okay, but how do we do this? I think there is a, there's a core group, uh, and I don't know how many of them, these are the ones that I've met, but there's a group within uh, Pearson who agrees with me and having been in a big corporation, I understand the challenges of trying to move the battleship that is this juggernaut of this multi-billion dollar conglomerate and, and they need something to be able to prove that this works and there's a way for us to do that. And so that's really been you know, my challenge with Pearson and, and where we are. Um, I don't have results yet to be able to talk through to say here's here's what they they've been doing, um, but I, I I hope that all of the, uh, the the participants who've come have found their uh, their participation to be markedly positive, and it's and it's really allowed us to have a great dialogue and get into kind of the understanding of how Pearson thinks about it, and have a a, a conversation about what it takes uh, to be able to make change there. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm going to click off the top here and see if you've got a follow-up for me. We, we we don't have time to kind of drill down too deeply. I think it's a thoughtful answer. Um, sort of another question about sort of weekend EDU that I hear is this question of uh, ideas that are not necessarily going to be uh, big money makers. So not venture capitalist, attractive, uh, an educator who has an idea for something that would really benefit education but doesn't have a model for large returns or large revenue. Um, how do those kinds of projects fit into Startup Week in EDU? Do you, do you feel like they end up sort of coming out productively? Oh, absolutely. So, um, and, and I just want to say I, I'm seeing all of these, um, these these questions that are being texted in, and I would love to answer them, and I, I totally am. I, I just have a hard time listening to you, Steve, and, and answering and typing these questions. So please go ahead and send them, and I will, I will take the time to, to make sure that I, I answer each of them. Um, but in terms of the idea, so a big mantra of, of Startup Weekend period and Startup Weekend education really is that Funding does not equal success, and, and we really want to make sure that we, we, we reinforce with all of our um, participants, and, and it, it's honestly, it's a little frustrating for me when somebody hears about what we do or start weekend, and the first question out of their mouth is like, well, how much have, who's been funded? Who's, would show me a startup that's gotten like, you know, $50 million, and, and while that is exciting and, and it, it does happen every once in a while, uh, our real uh, product is the change that we we uh, we help transform in people's lives, and it's about taking people who have an innovative idea that can benefit both both themselves and society, and teaching them how to take that that purpose that's within them and turn that into something that is both beneficial to society and sustainable to them. That's not saying that it's all like lifestyle businesses that are going to be, you know, one or two employees. Like we do believe that scalable enterprises are the manner in which um, commerce and, and, and capitalism, if you will, have produced tremendous good uh, in, our, in our society. Uh, and, and major advances are all brought about, or many major advances are brought about by the efficiencies that are created by these scalable enterprises. Um, but what we really teach people is that um, maintaining control of your idea and figuring out a process where you're not selling your idea as soon as possible and say, look, I'm going to work on this for a weekend and then somebody's going to come and give me $10 million. 
we, 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 we say, okay, well, what happens when someone gives you $10 million for that idea? That's really awesome. Okay, you did something and you just got $10 million, but now, now they own the idea. And the idea is still in its infancy and it still hasn't impacted anyone and you still haven't uh, figured out whether or not this is going to be your purpose and you're going to dedicate the next 10 or 15 years of your life to growing this entity and, and having it have a, a, tr uh, a significant impact on the whole reason why you started. You didn't start saying, I need to have $10 million. Maybe you did, but then you probably shouldn't have started in education entrepreneurship. Um, and so, so our our... Our takeaway that we, we try to have as many participants as possible take is that there is a process by which you can incrementally work on and improve your idea and get to the point where you can take small experiments and small steps to validating your idea, to building something that is sustainable, all while you are, you know, working or doing something else. That's why we call it Startup Weekend. It's about, you know, every weekend being an opportunity for you to get off work at Friday at 5 o'clock, say, this is my passion, this is the idea that's been burning within me for all this time. I'm going to put together a group of, of the right group of people, and I'm, we're going to bang this out, and we're going to work on it, and Sunday night we're going to make a decision as to whether or not we've got far enough to, to quit our jobs and keep moving on this, or whether or not we need to, we've learned something and we need to refine this idea further. But it's not about trying to get it to a point where it's ready to sell. It's about getting it to a point where it's sustainable and it can sustain you and then you can grow from that. And, and I think if more people kind of follow that model that, you know, there'll be more examples of of entrepreneurship in general, but also education entrepreneurship that really stays true to the principles on which they're founded and says, like, hey, we want to we want to support educators and we don't want to have to sell to them and we don't want to have to uh, have our solution be another solution that's going to get forced on people, be purchased at the district level because that's the only economical model on which we can figure out how to distribute it. And, and let me also add, as an educator coming in, I did feel that you had to listen with, with a, a balanced perspective. There, there is, when you're having these conversations with folks, then you question, well, how are you going to make money? What's your business model? And you are challenged on that point, and it's good to listen and to learn from them. But then, um, as I mentioned before, and as Khalid was saying, to just remember what, what, is your, what are your core values and how... What, what do you think is the best way to make money that will sustain you um, and, not, and not to ever violate those, those values, but just to, to be balanced in listening and then make decisions for yourself? Yeah, yeah, so Nikki's absolutely right. I think the last point before I turn over my microphone is that um, it's also important because one of the critical factors in you making your idea successful is your ability to attract other people to your cause. And while it's, it, I've seen many, many times an educator, a pure educator, come from the idea of why does this idea have to make money? The challenge that they always have is that, well, the designers and the developers and the other people who are going to want to work on it, they're looking for jobs. They're looking for opportunity. They're looking to have impact. And, and, and money is one measure of that. And so while it's not the end all and be all, um, it is a, a, a necessity uh, within life, and, and it does help um, gather more people to your cause. And so having a well thought through but balanced business model uh, is something that we think we can teach people to do well and, and something that Startup Weekend uh, holds as one of its core values. So we're going to move to Q&A in a minute, and I'm actually going to ask Jeff, who asked the question earlier, if he might consider raising his hand and, and actually asking that question. I read through it again, Jeff, and I think it, it might be okay to ask here. Um, but before we do so, Nicole, uh, Bud Hunt recently tweeted out or posted that there is no such thing as ed tech. It seems as though technology is is creating a moment in time where we could really see some dramatic changes in education. But from your perspective, both as an educator and as an entrepreneur, how do you view this moment in time? Is there such a thing as ed tech, or is there just education? And how does technology play right now into how we think about the future of education? Um, the, the way I think about it is, you know, there's education and there's technology and there are 
there are challenges within education that technology can address. Um, you can look at any technologies. I mean, we often use um, tools and words for assistive technology. Is that ed tech? And um, does, it, does it really matter what we call it? Um, if there are challenges that can be addressed and um, can help more people through the use of technology, then let's just either let's just call it good instruction or good pedagogy or good professional learning or good coaching or um, they, those are core principles that that generally don't change regardless of what the new um, the new technology may be. Um, their technology is a tool and that people can use. And, and like for example, you know, with, with our startup, technology is a, is a tool. It, it's not the essence of our idea. Um, the essence of our idea is grounded in, in, in good instruction and good professional learning. It's not, you know, we've debated within ourselves. Are we ed tech? Is it, is, are we an ed tech company? Does that even really make sense? Or um, are we just about supporting learning communities and, and, and helping them grow and have a greater impact. And so, um, you know, that, that's just how I think about it. it, it it's, it's more, it, technology is the tool. Um, it's not the end in of itself. So, the, uh, Khalid said earlier, and I thought it was really interesting, that a lot of people pin their hopes for change on entrepreneurship maybe bring a lot of baggage around kind of changing education, hoping that entrepreneurship will, will do that. There does seem to be kind of a context of hyperbole around technology dramatically changing education. As you look at this context of Khan Academy, Nicole, and you know, some of these other efforts and a lot of the money being put in, and as an assistant principal and educator, um, does any of that worry you that we're forgetting some of the core values around education? What, what worries me is when technologies are developed and used without the context or just without the conversation of people who are in education. So like around Khan Academy, when, when, they, when that first came out, we were like, oh, look, we can learn about why um, the stock market you know, crashed. I mean, so we were excited about that. And then when we heard that this was being used to, um, as a, the, a way to teach students, we were like, hmm, okay, that's interesting. And then when people were kind of, I guess there, there was a, in, in my mind, um, people were much more excited about it than I would be as an educator from a, a pedagogy standpoint because I was like, well, this just seems like lectures to me, um, which might be a nice tool for individualized instruction as a starting point, but this can't be the end-all, be-all of instruction. I mean, that, that's not great teaching. There has to be something else around it. There has to be a greater context. And I felt like that conversation was missing, and that's what worries me when um, tools are developed in isolation and no one's thinking about the context in which students learn, and you know, and that's different in different places. There's not one answer or one solution, but there has to be an open conversation about it, and to just um, hear of a technology that was produced without the input of an educator necessarily be hailed at this, as this great savior is very frustrating um, for me as someone who's chosen to make education my career. What I invite is to have a conversation about it and how to say, well, any tool um, may or may not be able to be used effectively to strengthen learning, but um, it has to be part of a bigger conversation and teachers and educators and um, principals and, and, and people who've been in this for a while need to have a voice in that too. So I don't know if the, you've put the two little ones to bed or what your arrangements are, but we do as a courtesy to our guests finish our sessions on time. So we have about five minutes for Q&A. Um, I want to go back to a question that Jeff asked. It was about some rumors around the cancellation of the Boulder, Colorado event. And he had heard that, a uh, colleague, that um, some developers were feeling like this was just a way of kind of giving getting them to give away their services for free. 
I don't know whether or not that was true in that circumstance or if it's ever been true, but are there some sort of interesting tensions that occur here with regard to people who come and compensation? Um, compensation, I think, is probably the, the, the I, don't, I don't get a lot of uh, conversation about compensation. Um, I think that exploitation is a fear that a lot of people have in the back of their head. Uh, and, and really, it's, it's, this, um, it's the way that you look at the situation. And so we, we've spent a lot of time kind of getting into the psychology of what drives a person to come to an entrepreneurship event. Uh, and, there's, and there's really two kind of mentalities. There's one of them is that um, a, a traditional hackathon uh, where a bunch of developers would get together um, and set some type of goal and say we're gonna we're gonna do this code sprint or whatever you might want to call it and get some product that is complete in this weekend. That traditional format was really looked at as a job interview. It was a way to, for you to develop skills and it was also a way for you to show off what you could do in a weekend and then all of a sudden get some type of offer or have some other uh, either angel investor or other group say, wow, you're a really awesome developer, come into my company. And if, and if that's your, uh, if that's the perspective that you come from, oftentimes you might think of, of a startup weekend as exploitative. Um, we have the same sort of challenge with a lot of designers. As designers uh, early on in their career uh, are really, um, exploited, for lack of a better term. They, they have to take on a lot of work under the guise of building their portfolio, uh, whereupon they feel like they are unjustly compensated or not compensated, or that they, um, they are uh, given uh, more menial tasks, etc. cetera. Um, but what we, what we talk about at Startup Weekend is that, A, this is, your, this is your opportunity for you to build a team. Every single person who comes to a startup weekend has an equal opportunity to lead. And, and the first step in being an entrepreneur is not jumping off the cliff, as a lot of people uh, think. It's convincing someone else to jump off the cliff with you. So the first step that you have to, to, to keep in mind is that you've got to communicate your idea and if you've got an idea that is strong and people see you as a leader, well, then you have the opportunity to build a team around you that now you can bring that idea to life. And that's true whether or not you're the, uh, an educator who has an idea and doesn't know technology, whether you are a uh, programmer who has an idea but really needs an educator to help them develop the, the pedagogical aspects of it, whether you're a designer who, who has an idea for a better system or a better user experience for something, but you need uh, some, a technical team to help you to, uh, to build the functionality. Everyone has that opportunity, and um, it's about you know, assuaging some folks' fears. Uh, so to getting to the, the guy's specific question, um, it certainly wasn't about whether or not uh, a few developers felt like they were going to be exploited, but it, it does, uh, when we start focusing specifically on education and some of the developers are saying, well, I, I, I wouldn't mind coming to an event, but I don't have an education-focused idea, that is a particular challenge, and, and we understand that, and we know that we have to go to larger communities that have a larger entrepreneurial or, or developer communities until we can find the subset of folks who have been a, a bit of a social mission or, or a realization uh, within themselves and say, I'd like to build something, like the next Instagram would be awesome, I'm not knocking that at all, but I'd, I'd like to build something that has some give back, some greater, and some greater benefit to society, uh, I think, and I'd like to be able to do that. And the challenge with Startup Weekend Education is how do we build some of the smaller communities into that. So we can do it in a New York, we can do it in a San Francisco, we can do it in a Seattle. Uh, it gets more challenging when you get to a Boston, an Atlanta, a Washington, D.C., you know, and then, you know, as you go, you know, to the next tier beyond that and even internationally. Uh, so, so that's our challenge and, uh, and, and we're always up against showing 
the experience of somebody that goes through a startup weekend, uh, but we have some some really strict guidelines that that prevent people from just showing up and trying to exploit people for some free labor for the weekend. This has been really interesting. Uh, thank you both so much for coming on the show. Contact information for Khalid and Nicole is in my blog post, uh, or they're both welcome to put their information in the bottom uh, in the chat and let people know. We, um, we do, as a courtesy, finish on time. So I'm going to use the clapping icon right now. It's the applause button under the smiley face. Thank you both so much for coming on. Thanks, Steve. This has been awesome. Yes, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, and I, I look forward to uh, to seeing you and, and uh, hopefully a lot of other these people in the chat at the uh, SD Unplugged. Yes, yeah, so don't forget Saturday night uh, before ISTE, the after party, or probably the uh, my announcement will come out tomorrow or Monday. Uh, there will be lots of information, especially at istheunplugged.com. Thanks to Khalid and Nicole. Really terrific. Uh, hope you didn't uh, have to make major arrangements for the kids. Um, on June 5th, Ruth from opensource.com comes on. On the 7th, Christine DiPaolo. Uh, and lots more coming up. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a great night or day, depending on where you are. So the question is, is this archived? And it will be. Go to futureofeducation.com and you'll be able to get access to the full recording that includes the chat or just the MP3. Also, if you'd like to stay in the room for a minute here, you can go up to File, Save, and you can save the chat if that's of value to you. In about three minutes, I do have to bump you out of the room so the recording can process. Sorry for doing that, but it is the way the system works. Take care, everybody. And thanks again, Khalid and Nicole.